All right. Uh, I'm going to go back a couple of slides because I don't know where. Okay, so yeah, we should only use binding if uh, things are the same size. I think we discussed this, uh, and you could see my screen, but R bind and C bind will do that. And so vectors are one dimensional, matrices are two dimensional. They have rows and columns, and data frames are like matrices, but they don't have to all have numeric data. And uh, well, maybe just let me show you, uh, let me remind you that we have this uh, data set weather. So if I, the head command will show you the first number of lines, and you can see I have certain things that look like numbers, and in fact they are numbers, and I have certain things that are clearly not numbers, like winter or direction of the wind. So if I ask for the class of weather, it's going to be a data frame. All right, so I was uh, discussing ways you can get a lot of data into uh, R without necessarily typing it in. And the colon will show you all the numbers between two numbers. And this is a special case of a function called sequence, or SEQ. And you give sequence three uh, values, where you want to start, where you want to end, and how much you want to go by. So sequence from one to seven by two will go one. One plus two is three, five, seven. Sequence from point one to point seven by point two will give you point one, point three, point five, point seven. Again, we can see this, here's one, five, and then sequence from equals, oops, equals point one comma two equals point seven comma by equals point two, and there we go. Now, imagine if instead of that, and remember with R, if you want to see what you've done previously, you just hit the up arrow, um, instead of from point one, I wanted to go to seven. This is not something I want to put in by hand. And as you can see, it's essentially instantaneous. Uh, great. And incidentally, I, having created these three vectors, I can see their contents by just typing them on the screen. And so that's the advantage of uh, our is that you can store things. So incidentally, if you weren't here last week, just a quick reminder, this screen here, the bottom left corner is the console. This is where you type commands. This uh, screen in the upper left corner allows you to create various kinds of files that you can use in R. So file, new file, you see scripts, notebooks, markdown. The most important ones are uh, script the most important one by far. So an R script is just a sequence of commands that you give R. So X equals log of 10, Y equals two, X star Y. And you can either run the whole thing by going source, it doesn't do you, or you can run it line by line. If you put it there and hit run, then it'll print to the screen. And now it goes to line two, run, and uh, now it's gonna print two times that. So X should be about 2.3, which we can check by doing this. Now scripts are very, very useful if you're doing multiple computations and you wanna save your material. All right, there are similarities with Mathematica, somebody writes, um, and the answer to that is, is yes, um, computer languages have two aspects, if you will, uh, strategy and tactics. Strategy is what I want to do. I want to add all these numbers. Tactics is how you do it, but in, in computer languages, tactics are called syntax. So the syntax of R is going to be different from the syntax of C, is going to be different from the syntax of Python, is going to be different from the syntax of Mathematica. However, there should be huge overlaps in uh, what they do. And as I said last week, 
R was the second language I seriously learned. It's the main language I use. Uh, the first one I learned was MATLAB. And I learned a lot of R because I knew from having worked with MATLAB the kind of things I wanted to do. And I would just say, how do I do an R? Something I knew how to do. How do I do a for next loop in R? How do I do a conditional? What is a logical in R? Because basically all these things are going to be the same. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about indexing. Uh, and there's, for one dimensional vectors, uh, it's pretty simple. So if you have some vector, remember we had vec1, vec2, and vec3. If I use, I use square brackets and I put something, it'll give me that element. So vec1 of 3 will give me the third element. Vec2 of 4 will give me the fourth element of vec2. Now there's one little tricky bit. If I say vec2 of minus 2, I get 157. So let's just go to the screen. Let's go to the videotape. Vec2 is that. So if I go vec2 of minus 2, what's it giving me? So the minus sign says don't do that. Okay? So vec2 of minus 2 says give me everything except minus 2. Now, this can be combined. So if I say vec2 of 1 through 3, that's going 1 through 3, that's going to give me the first three elements. I go vec2, and this is very useful, and this is an important little thing. I can't say minus of 1 through 3. I can say minus combined C of 1 through 3. This is going to say, give me everything in VEC2 except elements 1 through 3. Oops. I don't know why I'm having this problem. Which is to say the fourth element. Okay. So just sort of from right now, be happy with it kind of makes sense. I'm not sure I can do it all my... I could do it all myself because you learn how to do these things by doing. When you have a vector of length 100 and I just want the, the 25th through the 50th element, that's when you'll, when you have to sit down and use this example to do that, that's when you'll make more sense. So if I say, uh, let's just say W equals C of 1 through oops, 100, W is going to have length 100, but if I want the, well, I can do this, the 25th through the uh, 50th element, but if I want everything but the 25th through the 50th element, I have to go minus C of 25 through 50, and look, I go through 24, and then I have 51, just like you'd think. So that works. And um, indexing is really important because it, one of the things you're going to inevitably have to do with your data sets is get subsets of them. Okay. So as I said, matrices are two-dimensional. So you should, in data science, essentially without exception, you think of rows as observations and the columns as things you're observing. So, for example, in the weather da data set, each day is a row. You have a number of observations about the weather, including average temperature, amount of rain, average we uh, wind speed. So another example is you could have um, a data set of a stock as a matrix, where each day would be a row, and the columns could include opening price, closing price, high price, low price, anything you want, the volume of that day. But you should always think and get used, you should get used to thinking and always think of rows as observations of, of, a, of all the different variables you are interested in. Um, let's see. Uh, some more examples. Patient data. You could have each row as a patient and the columns could include information such as age, height, weight, cholesterol, and blood pressure. Well, this is an American example, uh, baseball, but if I know we have a large audience in India, maybe cricket is more appropriate, but I, I'm not familiar with what the statistics are for cricket. I just know that people have said that cricket is a similar sort of sport. So you could have for 
cricket, each row will be a cricket player and the columns will be statistics of interest to them. And then final example, food. You could have each row was a specific food and the columns could be uh, the calories and color and whether or not it's a uh, protein or carbohydrate. And then I have, or is it? And the reason I say that is because, of course, uh, color and protein and carbohydrate aren't numbers. So in fact, if I had such a thing, it wouldn't be a matrix, it would be a data frame. And we go back to our old friend, the weather, because no one ever gets tired of talking about the weather. And we can look, and again, you can see when you look at the summary, uh, it gives you for certain of the, so it gives you certain columns, it gives you numbers, and certain columns it just says it's character. I can't summarize that. So we discussed summary briefly uh, last week, but maybe this is a good time to uh, discuss summary again. So what summary does is it gives you some basic statistics. So uh, we had W. And we see it has the minimum, the first Q, the median, mean, third Q, and max. So Q stand for quartiles. So, so not quantile. Quantile is a more general thing. But this means 25% of the data is 25.75 or less. The median is 50.5. The median divides the data in half. We're going to talk more about medians later. The mean, that's the average value. That means if you summed all these numbers up and divided by the number, on average, that's what you get. Third quartile means 75% of the data, and the max is the largest value. So um, notice, if, if you use summary, you're getting a lot of basic statistics. So going back to, um, excuse me, to uh, this, we could get, uh, let's say, well, if I ask for summary of season, okay, so there are, we're talking about indexing, so there are two ways to get at season, and I, I just want to use this one, because usually columns have names, and frequently it's easier to uh, do it this way. So I'm going to show you a little nice trick with R. I've typed it. Now I can hit the home button and it'll take me back to the beginning. And now I can type in summary. And it just says it's 365 elements and it's class is character and we won't worry about mode at all. It's sort of like character class but more fundamental. But if I type summary weather dollar sign L dot temp, it's going to give me the numbers. So data frames can contain data, some of which can be numbers and some of which can be characters for which you cannot summarize. Um, I believe I have another quiz. Let's see. No, oh, I want my Okay. Okay, so I have a couple that I want to give you right now, and I'm going to give you a minute for each. And the first one is, will C bind work on columns of different lengths? So, launch. Will C bind work on columns of different lengths? I'll give you a hint. I did discuss it. I think I like polls because it gives me an opportunity to drink my coffee. All right, just another few seconds and then I'm going to uh, close the poll.
Okay, okay so, so yeah. Just a bit. Uh, is there any way to see what percentage of people are getting these uh, these polls. questions correct? Yeah, polls correct without disclosing their identities. Just just a summary. <laughs> well, it's funny you should say that, Manish, because what I was next going to do just before I close it was tell people the results. <laughs> okay. Great. So I, I I don't actually see how to um, make you see it. I'll I'll find out for next week. But fifty percent said no, it won't. 17% yes it will and 33% said yes it will but not in a good way. So the correct answer is yes it will but not in a good way. Remember CBind will um, will just sort of take the shorter one and add an, and, and recycle the elements long enough. So it will, I mean it's technically correct, but the answer I was going for was um, yes it will but not in a good way. Uh, CBind will as lots of things with R will try and make life good. Uh, let, let's just do one more example to see this. So I'm going to close this poll now. Um, so let me say call one vector one three. And so I'm just describing that. I'm going to say it's C of, uh, let's make it four through six. And you can see I have something of one three now. Four, five, six, and let's just say one two is equal to c of ten comma twenty. So if I hit c bind one three comma one two, it's not a. It says no, it can't. But if I hit c bind of one um, two comma. Hey, I don't. Uh, your screen. I think you're. Screen My, is not oh, that's shared. right. That's right. Whenever I um, I'm sorry. I, I forgot. When I do a poll, for some reason, it takes me off air and it doesn't put me back on. Okay. So in those two cases, it, it doesn't. Uh, but let me go back to here. Um, but in this case, you can see. I had one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, five. In this case, it does do it. So what's going to happen is, is is variable, but in the case that it does, actually, um, you know, all right. So let me just R gives two types of message. These are warnings. Warning means I'm doing something, but I'm not sure you want it. Error means I can't do it, and it throws it. So it says warning, and um, and it's going to do it anyway. So C bind one three one two, four five six ten twenty ten, and uh, it doesn't. And in this, this one it said warning number of rows result is not a multiple of the vector. It it, it throws the same. It does the same thing in this case, but it it, it gives you uh, a. It just changed the. In, it, excuse me, I'm having a sort of Sunday morning issue because I put length two instead of length three. It just simply puts the sec, this length two vector first, but it does the same thing, 10, 20, and it repeats the 10. So that'll true. So it will do it, but not necessarily do what you think. And again, if I do R bind, the same thing happens. Okay. So the moral of the story is you can do it, but you shouldn't. Okay, so one more poll, and this time I'm going to try and remember to turn my screen back on after we're done. Okay. And let me launch. So I'm now asking, what is the difference between a um, matrix and a data frame? Okay, so far everyone's got this 100% correct, so I'm going to give you less time. Just another 10 seconds.
Okay, so 100% of the, let me close this. Uh, people can see your screen. Okay, so 100% of you got that a data frame is a matrix with mixed data type. All right. Uh, I just want to go on and you, you will learn this more through doing, but the same thing works for matrices. You use a square bracket and it tells you. So 2, 3 would say, and the only important thing to say is, remember, is matrices have rows and then columns. So position 2, 3 would mean second row, third column. Position 1, 1 would mean first row, first column, the element in the upper left. And so if I make this matrix, the numbers one through nine, element two, three is second row, third column is eight, element one, one is first row, first column is one. Uh, so you have to let R know what matrix you want, but once you tell it what matrix you want, this will work for matrices and data frames. All right, uh, let's, I want, I want to get to uh, the statistics element, so I'm just going to quickly go through this slide and then go to statistics because I do want to do some statistics today. So R understands how to get many elements at once, R understands everything except, and R understands things like give me all elements satisfying some condition. This last thing is called logical indexing. When you become more expert at R, using logical indexing is very, very useful. It allows you to get out all sorts of things from your data that are not so uh, obvious. So just remember, R understands how to get many elements at once. You can use the combine or just the colon notation and say, give me a bunch of elements. And R understands everything except that's the minus sign, okay? Oh, yeah, I, I think there's one other important point I should make about referencing matrices is, is if, if you don't say anything, so if you say colon XXX or XXX colon, that means in this first case, give me all the rows in that specific column. In this case, it means give me that specific row and all the columns. So I just have one nice example of it. Uh, so M of one colon two would give me rows one, two, and column one. Um, M of colon one would say, give me all the rows, the first column. M of two comma nothing would give me the second row, all the columns. And we can see that this does that. Remember, it's one, two, three. One, two, three. Um, Okay, which is something that you're going to see. This is a way to give you indices. So just briefly, which will tell you which which indexes in your matrix are satisfy that condition. So if I create this matrix with the numbers one through 100 and I say large index is which M is greater than 95, it's gonna give me the indices that are greater than 95. So if I wanna create a matrix with just those indices, M of large index is going to give you that. So you can see M large is 96, 97, 98, 99, 100. Voice is not clear. Uh, I hope that's a little better. I can move the microphone. Uh, can I explain about factors? So we haven't talked about factors yet. Uh, I, I want to put off discussing factors till uh, a little bit, but roughly so. I've been asked what is a factor. A factor is a different class of data. Factors are like characters, but when you have a specific finite number of classes which you can fit into, you call it a factor. So for example, uh, if I have wind speed, that's numeric. If I have wind direction, typically it'd be north, south, east, west, or you might have eight of them, north, east, northwest, south, southwest, etc. Those can be considered as factors. I had a data set with um, housing information, and each row would be a house, and the data might include the price the house sold for, 
Uh, what color the house is, that would be a factor. Uh, what is the square feet, that would be numeric. Uh, how many rooms? Now, rooms is actually interesting because you can consider it a number, rooms that can be counted, but it's really a factor in the sense that it takes one of a finite number of values. You can't, you, we don't have houses with 10,000 rooms. We don't. Okay, so uh, I found this. I just uh, one comment on the. Yeah. Hello. Uh, one uh, comment on the previous slide you had. Can you can you go back to the previous slide? This one. This slide. This one or this one? Yeah, so where you are looking at this, uh, yes, whether you look, you have this M greater than 95, which M greater than 95, like where you're creating the large index, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to, uh, I think I'm lag, I can stop. Wait a second. No, I'm seeing what Manish, you're wrong with this picture. Up. Not. Uh, Manish, you're like not... where you have greater than 95. Where you get a conditional. Manish, you're not yes, coming out clearly yes. at all. I, I, I just can't understand the question you're asking. Okay. Okay, let me write. Yeah, write it in chat and then... Okay, well, he does that. So, let me just create a new data set equals sequence oops, from equals three to equals nine comma by equals point five. So we see we have new data. I have three, three and a half, da da da. So let's say I, I wanted um to know which of these cases are uh, are bigger than four. So I could write which new data greater than four. Uh, and it's going to give me the first index is one, two, three, four. It's four and a half, right? And so the indexes in this case are, happen to be four through thirteen. So this says if I look at new data, if I look at new data. So let me give that index a name. So remember, I can go home to go there and say just call it IDX equals. Now, if I look at new data of index, I don't get four through thirteen. I get four and a half through nine. Those are the data points. So in these simple examples, it's it's you know it's you can kind of see what's going on but let's say if I said new data was equal to our norm and this means you just get a ra random distribution so I'm going to pick a hundred random numbers with mean zero and now I want uh, index to be equal which new data is greater th oops greater than well, let's make it less less than 0.3 now, if I if I look at new data, I get a hundred numbers. But if I look at new data of index, I'm just going to get the ones that are less than 0.3. 
and you see, for example, just, just one example, 0.38. So we had 100 random numbers, and now we have, uh, well, how much is that going to be? 63 of them. So 63 of the 100 numbers. Okay, so Manish was asking uh, that which is giving an index with value. One can also have conditional on the content of the matrix. Uh, we're right. So I, I think actually I've, I've answered Manisha's question, which was you wanted to make it clear that it was asking, do the logical indexing have to return things that um, are in the that look the same? And as we can see here, the answer is no. What it will do is return them in the same order. So if I look at index, you can see it gives me the indices of the matrix. So this says that if I looked at new data of three, it's going to be less than uh, 0.3. The same with four, but not 0.5. So let's let's just take a look. New data of five is almost one, so it's going to leave those indices out. So the, in this case, the indices, one which are numbers between one and 100, have nothing to do with the values. But what in, what which will do is it'll keep things in the same order. So that's the that's and that's important. I love this. Uh, this was sent to me by my brother last week with um, no particular um, connection with the class. But I mean, actually, a very famous 19th century politician, Benjamin Disraeli, who said statistics don't lie, statisticians do. And I, I think this is a good example. And the question is, somebody took a poll of, is truncating the y-axis dishonest? And it looks like it's yes or no because, of course, he's truncated, left off the bottom. In fact, what this says is 95% of the people say, yes, it is dishonest. Only 5% say no, but the way this is displayed, it looks like it's 50-50. So the point of all this is, what is statistics doing? It's giving you numbers that are going to describe a bigger set of numbers. You have to be careful to understand that any statistical description of a data set, short of just giving you all the numbers, is going to only cover certain aspects. And the issue is, if you're being honest, is to try and understand, give enough statistics so that people can really uh, understand what you're, the limits of what you're describing. And um, Another point that statistics will, will learn how to answer is, if I, if I give you something, an answer, you, you want to say, well, how confident are you? Like if somebody says, it's going to rain tomorrow, you say, well, why? And you say, well, it's cloudy out. And uh, it's cloudy out, it rains 55% of the time. That's, uh, he's giving you a number or an answer, yes, but it's very different than if he says, it's going to rain, and you say, why? You can say, well, I see rain clouds over there, and I just talked to my brother over there, and it's raining very hard there. So we want to look at numbers that will help you describe a data set and understand what they can and can't do. So remember the um, summary function. That covers all this information except the mode. The smallest number of a data set, the largest number, the mean, we'll talk more about that in a second, the median, which is the value so that half the data is less and half the value is greater. The mode, the mode is something that um, we use less often, but it's worth knowing the term. The mode is the number that occurs most often. And quantiles, and in uh, the specific, and when you use the summary function, it gives you the quartiles, which is dividing into quarters, but quantiles divides the data into pieces of equal amount. So Typically, you see deciles or percentiles. So this means so if you divide the data into deciles, you're dividing the data into 10 ordered pieces, each of which has one-tenth of the data. Uh, is there anything? All right. Uh, where am I? 42. Give me half a second. I want to see if I want to do another survey. Okay, so 
if I give you a number like the mean or the median, you can ask how confident you are. And the two basic numbers that you use to measure this are standard deviation and variance. So standard deviation is more common because it has the same basic units. So if I say to you the mean of a certain people, group of people is the mean age is 11, and I can give you the, 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 the um, standard deviation, that will also be in years. So I can say they're all, um, the mean age is 17, and the standard deviation is a half a year. That means on average, people are within a half a year of uh, 17. If I give you the standard deviation is 12, I mean something different. I mean you have some very, very all large people. Variance is, um, oops, excuse me. Variance comes up a lot uh, when we start talking more about uh, some of the abstract distributions you might see, particularly the normal distribution. And standard error, which we'll see as an application of um, uh, standard deviation and sampling, is again, it, it's, it's, it's essentially standard deviation. It tells you how much you can expect things to be off. Uh, to this. So just more details, the mean, and I'm sorry, but for some reason my um, R installation is being very fussy and is not allowing me to print math equations, but the mean is generally distributed, uh, listed by mu, the Greek letter mu, and what it just says is you take all the numbers, you add them up, and then you divide by how many numbers you have. Now the median would just divide it in two, and so one point is, is it, the median is going to be much less sensitive to outliers because it, it doesn't care if your number is one, two, three, four, five, which has median value three because you have one, two to the left and four, five to the right, or one, two, three, four, one million, in which case you have one, two to the left and four and a million to the right. So median is going to be of use in cases where you know for a fact, and I, I can't emphasize this enough, where you know for a fact your exceptionally large or exceptionally vol small values are due to error. Okay, so I think I just said this. Mean is most useful because it has best arithmetic properties. Median is useful when you are not interested in outliers, but the $64,000 question is what is an outlier or is that data an outlier? And variance and standard deviation, as I said, standard deviation is a measure of um, how much your data differs from the mean. And I think I have an example. So I created uh, two groups here. Group one is 14, 18, 20, 22, 26. And in R, the function for getting the mean is mean. So if I ask for the mean of this group one, I get 20, which is not surprising. Uh, this is 2 less than 20, this is 6 less than 20, this is 2 more than 20, this is 6 more than 20, so on average, they're just going to be 20. Now, remember, our norm is this function which will give you the normal distribution. And so I'm just taking five numbers with a mean of 20 and a standard deviation of 0.1, a very small one. In this case, you can see I get numbers all really close to one, and I get the mean is 20.01. So for all practical matters, these two, I, I've been asked the question, I'll, I will answer it in just a second. So in these two uh, cases, these numbers, these two groups have essentially the same uh, uh, mean. However, we'll see that um, their standard deviation is very different. And so the question I've been asked is why are variance and standard deviation measures of dispersion from the mean and not based on the median? It actually gets back to what I said before, which is the mean has best arithmetic properties. So I gave you a formula for the mean. It didn't come out very nicely, but it was an arithmetic formula. What did I say about the median? I said it's the number that divides the data in two. There is no formulaic version of that. Similarly, let me just go ahead, the standard deviation is formulaic. 
it gives you it what it's what this complicated equation is saying is I look at all my data points I see how much it differs from the mean I square that to make it positive I add up all those differences and then I take a square root so you could get a standard deviation from mean values but because you don't have a good arithmetic formula for the median you can't manipulate it so let's go back to the sort of the founding of statistics in my opinion uh, and I've been asked the question why n minus 1 and not n uh, and that was in some sense by Gauss who discovered the normal distribution when he was looking at errors in astronomical observations so the reason why uh, the mean and the standard deviation came about is because uh, Gauss discovered that this distribution was accurate for astronomical errors and in fact those were the quantities that you needed to describe the normal distribution uh, the mean and the standard deviation or the mean and the variance uh, they're it's very similar uh, the standard deviation uh, is with the square root if you don't take the square root then you get variance sorry um, and the, the only thing I'll point out is in this formula you have n minus 1 and not n we haven't talked about it much but mostly we um, there are we taking samples and when you take samples you need to put this n minus 1 and rather than n to get mathematically correct answers if you knew you had the whole population you would have n uh, this it does it actually is talking about a very important point which is called degrees of freedom the point is is you have n data points but because you have the mean which involves all the data points you really have one less piece of information than you think which is to say if I give you if I have let's let me just put it this number if I have five data points I can calculate the mean which means if I have the mean in any four data points I can calculate what the fifth is I can back it out so really when you have the mean in here one of the end pieces of information has already been determined so to get the true average you need to divide by n minus 1 now in the words of an American movie tell them the good news Mortimer the point is is if n is 3 this is really significant if n is 7 it makes some difference if n is 20 you won't notice the difference if n is 100 or 500 they're indistinguishable so in practice whether something is a sample or a population in statistics as we deal with doesn't become important uh, but in fact you know when you look at more advanced things you, you, you'll do the, the, a, a very famous question is somebody says there's two functions that calculate singular value decompositions in R why do they give different answers and the answer is specifically because one is using n minus 1 and calculating a sample and one is using n and calculating uh, um, a population standard deviation so that's well, I, I call it the somewhat long answer. It has to do with theoretical. So all this has to do with theoretical properties. You know, we're wasting our times if we want to knock our heads against the wall and just sort of ask unanswerable questions. Standard deviation and mean are the, become the de facto two basic statistics because they're the two statistics that we can easily get our hands on we can always calculate them we can calculate them easily and they work in the normal distribution now you may say all right great so what about the normal distribution but just to give you a hint for something going forward the reason why people always like to assume normal distributions is because if you have a normal distribution you can make the most precise statistical statements that you could hope to make so you could so, so you have the data with a mean if you have a normal distribution that is the distribution that's going to have the most data within one standard deviation of the mean in some sense that can be you know sort of you can just sort of say common sense but can be made more precise 
Um, any more questions on what I've talked about? Not for the rest of the life. Okay, so just to go back, we have this definition of standard deviation, which is telling you how much on average the data differs from the mean. And if we go and we look, the standard deviation of group one is almost four and a half. What does that mean? It means on average, people were within only within four and a half years of the average age of 20. Whereas SD, which is standard deviation of group two, on average, you were within a tenth of a year. Right? So using the standard deviation for those two groups, we all of a sudden see a better picture. So remember, this is group one, which is 14, 18, 20, 22, 26. And you can see the, uh, this is, these two, 18 and 22 are two years apart. 26 and 14 are six years apart, eh, four years is about right. Here you can see all the data is really close. And, you know, on average, these differ from about a tenth of a year from the mean of 20.01, seems clear. All right, so we're gonna talk more about confidence intervals and distributions next week. Uh, but just some key takeaways. I consider this first point, you know, very intuitive. When you're doing sampling, the larger the sample you have, the better you're going to get an estimate. And we'll see next week when we talk more about confidence intervals and standard errors. And in general, if you have an estimate of some number, you want to have an idea how accurate your estimate is. And knowing the size of your sample and standard deviation, that'll help. And these last two things, if you know somehow something about the distribution of values of your population, you can use that to get an idea of how much off you're likely to be. This dovetails to what I was saying, that if you have data that's normal or pretty much normal, the advantage of the standard of using normal distribution is you now have theoretical understanding of it and that allows you to get very good practical estimates for how off you're going to be. So and then I'm asked if I have two samples with the same mean but different standard deviation what can be inferred. So the practical inference of that is the larger the standard deviation uh, the less mm, out of, I would say two things the less satisfied you are with the estimate of the mean uh, the less uh, information you can draw about a typical uh, element or person in it. So let's, let's go back here. Suppose these two groups are employees of a company, right? So you want to, so you have one group where your employees range from age 14 to 26 and the other group where they range from age, well, very small, they're all essentially 20. Now, if you knew just that these two groups had um, mean uh, 20, and you said, I want to pick one of these groups to uh, have the task of uh, driving, you know, they're, they're going to be in charge of taking all my uh, products from my warehouse to my store, you say, well, how old are the people in group one? They're about 20. How old are the people in group two? They're about 20. There's nothing very helpful in that. But if you say, what's the standard deviation? You say, well, it's four and a half years for the first group, and it's a tenth of a year for the second group. You say, well, if I randomly pick somebody from group two, they're likely to be over 19 for sure, and so I can use them as a driver. If I pick somebody from group one, that's no longer going to be the case. Now, let me give you another example. We've heard a lot in recently about polls and accuracy of polls. If I told you, you know, I, I you know, I, you know, I poll a hundred people about, um, you know, whether the president's doing a good job and they could give them a score of one through five and the average score is two and a half, you might very well say, well, that's in the middle. People, you know, just kind of are neutral on them. But then you could say, well, what's the standard deviation? If I tell you the standard deviation is 0.3, that means most people, you know, were within 2.2 .2 to 2.8. And we'll make this more precise next week, exactly how many most people we can say. We say, yeah, most people just think he's doing an average job. If 
I tell you the standard deviation is two and the average score is two and a half, that means that there's a lot of people who are saying he's doing a great job and there's a lot of people who are saying he's doing a crappy job. On average, you, can, you, you can't say, you know, most people are saying he's two and a half. Most, the only way you can get a standard deviation of two with an average of two and a half is there's got to be a lot of readings that are a distance of two or more away from the two and a half, i.e. 0.5 and 4.5. And imagine you asked two people, and one was a Trump supporter and said four and a half out of five, and the other guy who hated him said a half out of five. You would see these two people disagree tremendously. And then you ask two people, and one goes, that eh, 2.4, and then you go, that eh, 2.6. You got two people who are just really indifferent. So standard deviation can really add a lot to what you are um, seeing. Just knowing the average is, is rarely or not. And in fact, you know, as we go on, we're, go we're going to see this over and over again. In some sense, you can say the mean is, is, is your estimate, and the standard deviation is giving you strong information on how confident you are in your estimate. You know, what do you, what do you think, you know, the, um, let's say you have a stock. Say, so what do you think the average price is going to be tomorrow? I think it's going to be 20. What's your standard deviation? A half a point. Well, you, you, you might make a trading strategy on that. But if you ask the same guy, what's your, I think the average price is going to be 20. What do you, what's your standard deviation for your estimate? How confident are you? And he says, well, it could be anywhere between 15 and 25. That's not useful information. Okay. Uh, we're running a little over, but I just, since it shows up early in the text, I want to mention plots and histograms. Uh, so these are just ways to visualize the data. Now, as I said, remember, the dollar sign day is, when you know the names of a variable, this is usually easier than figuring out which variable. So I have plot the day versus rain. So this is not a particularly interesting plot, but it does give you a plot of the day versus the rain. This is a little more interesting. This is rain versus weather. So here we see the average temperature. And here we see we have much rain. So it kind of divides into, so, you know, just uh, this is not tremendously interesting, but this sort of says that when you're looking at rain, it looks like it divides in two. Somewhere around uh, this 16 degree mark, you get rain. You get rain there, and somewhere in the middle, you don't see a lot of rain. So, so somebody's asking, does standard deviation give you a confidence interval? And um, the answer is yes. You can use standard deviation to give you confidence intervals, which will be covered, as I said, next week. But how confident you are depends upon the distribution. And as I said, the nice thing about the normal distribution is that um, it gives you the strongest possible confidence intervals. So uh, histograms are, are the same thing. So histograms give you distribution of, of a given variable, how often it occurs. So here we see the temperature. That's kind of interesting. It's not uniform at all. And uh, so this is kind of amusing. This shows you uh, something very nice about statistics. So our norm is a normal distribution. So I'm taking a thousand, and when I just do it this way, it says I'm taking a thousand samples of a normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one. And we can see I'm not getting the average value zero. If I did this again, I would get a, a different plot. Just because on average you get zero doesn't mean when you take a sample that's going to happen. Um, I may want to give another poll. Uh, let me see. No, I don't want to do that. Uh, okay, somebody has asked me to discuss the difference between a histogram and a distribution. I'm sorry, wrong thing. So a histogram 
is a visualization of the distribution of a data set. So in this case, you can see that the y-axis is how often and it occurs well, between numbers between zero and slightly more than 200. And so this is telling you, uh, so we have one, two, three, four bins. So each bin is a half. So this says that between the value of zero and minus 0.5, we have a little over 200 observations. In the range between zero and plus 0.5. Hey, Adam, your yeah. uh, screen is not visible. You have a poll showing up there. That's interesting because I didn't get the poll to, show, to tell me. It, it's just telling me it's closed. All right, let me, uh, gosh. I think somehow it shared the poll results. So there's a way you can share the poll results from the previous okay. poll. That's what I must do. Okay, are you seeing my, okay, now I have to show my screen. Now are you seeing my screen? Yes. Okay. All right, as I said, uh, next week I'll understand polls better. Okay, so if we look at this, this is giving us, the histogram is a visualization of the distribution of your values in your data set. So, in, in fact, by just counting one, two, three, four, I see there are four chunks between zero and minus two and also between zero and two, which says this is dividing it up into 0.5 intervals. So the most data is between zero and minus 0.5, north of 200. Between minus 0.5 and one, there is roughly 140. And there's closer to 100 results between uh, uh, one, negative 1 and negative 1.5. On the positive side, we see there's a little bit more than 150 results of between 0 and 0.5. So a histogram is just a way of visualizing the distribution. Uh, as I said, I was asked to discuss the difference between a histogram and a distribution, and so that's my final answer. A histogram is the way of seeing the distribution, right? So if we go back to the previous histogram, we can see how many times the weather was in a given range. And this is, of course, obvious. The low degree temperature was between a given range. And we can see the most common was, you know, looks like between 16 and 18, okay? Between 18 and 20, and, and there's almost very few temperatures north of five or less than four. But so the histogram gives you the distribution of the data. Now, I just want to make one final point. Uh, when you have data that's real like this, looking at a histogram will give you an idea about how the data is distributed and will give you an idea about what you might expect for the mean. So for example, looking at this, I would say the mean is going to be somewhere around 14 degrees. I'm just sort of taking that as the end. And, and we can actually uh, check that with R. So let me clean my screen. So I can ask for the mean of the weather. And then it was L temp. Now ah, it's a little off, 12.6 degrees. Okay, so I was overly influenced by this big chunk of things over here and didn't realize. Um, so it, it's just a way of visualizing the data, of course, by the way. We can get all the information if we need it. Um, by using the summary function. Now you may ask, if I can get the mean from the summary function, why don't I just use a summary function rather than the mean? And the answer is because there are times when you're going to want to use the mean in some other more complicated calculation, and so it's easier to just use the mean rather than the summary and just take it out. So one, two, three, four, five, six pieces of data in the summary of which the mean is the fourth, so what that says to me is if I ask for the summary 
and this is some sort of vector. So if I ask for the fourth piece of data, I'm going to get the mean. Right? And so clearly if I have to type summary weather dollar dot temp of four, well that'll give me the mean. It's just a lot easier to go mean oops weather dollar. Okay. Are there any more questions? All right, so um, I think I've managed to cover most, if not all, of the, what I consider the high points in the reading for the week. The homework from the class will be uh, due by next Sunday. I believe some people have already turned it in. I will um, pulse out later today, well, or tom by tomorrow in any event, the reading assignment for next week and uh, the homework that will be due uh, two weeks from today. Are there any other questions? If not, I'm going to book you like for us. Okay, so I'm asked, what are the books? Uh, so the books were, um, the books were in the syllabus, which you should have. Uh, I, 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 all these assignments came, if, if you got the assignment, I believe it all solicited the book, which is uh, Richard Nell's, uh, hmm, I don't have it up here. Oh, let's go. Okay, so, this, this, there, there were two books that were assigned. So far we've only used, uh, I don't remember the exact title. Hopefully this will bring it to me. Yes. Introductory R, A Beginner's Guide to Data Visualization. This is available as a Kindle book, so you can read it online only. It's only $5. I don't consider that a significant investment. See, I bought it. <laughs> um, the other book is called R for Data Science. And again, this is written out in the, uh, the syllabus. Okay, so the Nell book, a hard copy, is not available. It just isn't. Is this book, and you can buy it as a hard cover. You can buy it as a paperback. You can generally get it for around uh, used, uh, 32 new from 629. All right, so this is uh, an important feature of Amazon. Do not buy this book for $6.29 from Catherine Bogard. It's a fraud. But it, you can see it's available for about $25. You can also find it uh, online on Hadley Wickham's site for free. So if you want to read it online. Um, all right, so a couple more questions. Uh, how to submit assignment? That's explained on the ACADS webpage. I don't know. I, I, you're better off looking there than asking me. As Manish says, it is all on the course page. Uh, are we not going to cover stem and box plot distribution or are they not that widely used? Uh, unless people petition me, I am, um, and somebody says the assignment is from introductory R. Yes, we have not used the second book at all yet. We'll start using that I think next week and if not next week, the week after for sure. Uh, no, we're not going to use uh, stem and box, stem and box uh, plots. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I, let me just say, the only place I've seen them is in older statistics books, and that's why. Uh, I honestly think that if you look at summary and uh, histograms, you get a much better feel for the data. If there's interest, I'll be glad to explain them uh, next week. Let me see. I just want to make sure I've looked at all the questions. Uh, Right. So you submit uh, assignments uh, via the ACADS webpage. Uh, the homework and the reading assignments for last week are already up. The assignments for this coming week, which the most important thing will be to do the reading, is going to go up today or tomorrow. Uh, right now, we've only used the first book, uh, the introductory book by by now, it's only $5. It's a really nice book. 
Uh, the other book you can buy or uh, get, get online for free. Um, as I said, we'll be using uh, the second book starting either this coming week or uh, the week after at the latest. I have to think about exactly how I wish to do things. All right, having said that, I think that's about it for now. I'm going to stop the recording and leave the session. So guys, have a great rest of your weekend.